Hi, everyone, and welcome to one of my seminars that I'm offering this winter and this spring. I'm bringing you topics that are important for you as a professional and as a business owner, and I'm hitting on some things that will help you increase and be better at what you do. So the first one that I'm doing today is the top five mistakes to avoid as an IEC. My name is Cindy McDonald, and I am the college counselor's coach. So most of you know who I am, but just a little bit of background about me. I've been an educational consultant for over 30 years. I started off actually doing financial aid consulting, which back then was not a thing at all. And that's part of the reason I helped to start the Higher Education Consultants Association, HACA, was to be able to offer more opportunities and expand our profession and the connections that we have as professionals and provide more professional development. I teach in the UCLA College Counseling Certificate Program. Some of you may have had me as an instructor there. I'm very proud to have been a female entrepreneur in technology and educational consulting, and now as a business coach. I also live and work in Central California. And I've always said, if I, first of all, I have more cows in my county than I have people. And if I can start a thriving, growing practice here, you can have a thriving, growing practice no matter where you are. And especially now, since it's so much easier and more accepted to go virtual, you can create a practice and see people all over the world. So now the journey that I'm on as a consultant, and you'll hear me talk about our journeys, is I'm now offering business and professional coaching. People ask me all the time, for my input and my advice and um, just my experience to, to help them, guide them in their practice. So over the last three years, I've started offering business professional coaching. I am the college counselor's coach. We are all in the business of customer service. This industry, we're not selling shoes, we're not selling jewelry, we're selling services. And so making our customers happy and meeting their needs is a key part of what we do. So we keep that in mind as I talk about these top five mistakes that I see consultants and I've seen this happen over the last 30 years. These all connect to your entrepreneur's journey. And as I mentioned about journeys, I've broken them down into four different journeys. And the comments that I have today will touch on almost all of these. The prospect's journey is your marketing, building your practice. How do you get the word about who you are, building your brand, um, letting people know. So that's the prospect's journey. The client's journey is what you have them and have signed them on, what happens and how do you onboard them and how do you service them? This is where the big service-based aspect comes to our work. The consultant's journey is what is your journey? You need to pay attention to that. This is where mindfulness, work-life balance, those are things that I'll be addressing in future workshops. All of these things I'll be addressing in future, more intensive, interactive one-on-one -on -one workshops. And then also the last one is your organization's journey. How is your business growing? What is the aspect you have? So those are the different aspects that we're going to talk about as I talk about these five mistakes to avoid. Now, some of you may be just starting out, you haven't started yet, or you've been in practice for years and years. This is more of a pep talk than anything. I want you to be empowered and I want you to think about what you're doing and be proud of what you're doing. But some of these mistakes I've seen repeatedly in my years of business. So let's see where you fall in and think about what your answers are to some of these mistakes that I see that I'm gonna share with you. So number one, don't know enough. As a service-based industry, as a content-based industry, we often feel like, gosh, I don't know enough. I want you to kick that to the curb. You can be an expert 
without having all the expertise because you can learn, you can grow, you can go to the internet, you can ask questions, you can make a phone call. You do not have to know it all in order to be an excellent admissions college counselor. You can be the expert without having all the expertise. So I want you to make that your mantra. You don't have to know it all in order to provide service and value to the families that you work with. The second part of that is if you're still thinking about starting your practice or you haven't yet, don't wait to start until you know it all. It's like having children. If we waited until we could afford children, none of us would ever have kids. So just get started, build a base, build a foundation of knowledge expertise, visit colleges, do professional development, do workshops, do training, get a foundation. But after a certain point, you just have to jump in with both feet and move forward. So I'll give you some building blocks for that, but don't wait to start. I had one person that I worked with and she had waited like almost five years in order to, and still didn't have a client because she was trying to get to a point where she felt like she knew everything. And so I finally just said, just go do it. Go get a client, get a pro bono, just do it. Cause you're never going to learn it all until you actually have students to work with. So it's like being a teacher, never being in a classroom. You, you've got to go in and you've just got to get your feet wet. And then the other thing I want to invite in you is confidence. Don't feel like you're an imposter. You've knowledge, you have experience, you have um, background, you have a personality, you have skills. Those are things that are going to help families. You are going to connect with families. And this goes with finding that ideal client. You know, find the people that are going to connect with you. And, and that is what value you're going to bring to them. So don't worry about being an imposter or feel like you're an imposter. Avoid that imposter syndrome because you have confidence. You have something you're bringing. And this comes up in other aspects of what I'm talking about today. So number one, I don't know enough. Cross that off your list. Don't make that mistake. Realize you can be the expert without having all the expertise. And the ways to build your expertise are, you know, using, committing to professional development, doing summer trainings through professional organizations, doing the workshops that I offer, going to different seminars and webinars offered by the college, participating in online forums, foster a mindset of learning. And as you do that, because this is such an evolving profession, we're always learning and garnering new information. So just build your expertise and have confidence in that. And this is part of your consultant's journey. So that's important. Number two, I can't charge full price. This is another thing that I see over and over and over again. People think, oh, well, I live in rural, you know, South Carolina or Delaware or wherever, and I can't charge full price. I live in about as rural an area as possible, and I've found there are ways that you can do it. So there are reasons that you want to be able to um, explore what you can charge. And so a lot of times people say, you know, I can't charge full price. I'm new. I don't have this experience. The person down the street's charging this. But keep in mind, and don't undervalue your time. If you don't charge enough, then you might be making five or ten dollars an hour. You can go down to McDonald's and earn that. You can go to well, if you're in California, you can go to In Out Burger and earn way more than that. So make it worth your while. And if you value yourself and your time then your clients will too. And they'll be willing to pay you that. So you have to have that mindset. And this is one of the things that I go into. We spend a whole workshop on this concept of naming your price. What should your rates be? So if this is something you're struggling with, sign up for one of my upcoming name your price workshops. And I can, we'll, actually go through an exercise and a whole um, discussion and agenda on how to set up your pricing. But it all revolves around this topic. Don't undervalue your time 
and make sure you watch your real-time commitments. You may say, okay, here's my pricing. I'm offering these services for 20 hours at X amount. And then you, once you look at your real time, how much you're spending, maybe you're spending 25 or 30 hours with those students. You're leaving money on the table if you're not charging for that. So look at that. Same kind of thing, the opposite concept is to time box. You know, do a time box your time. So if you're going to say you're going to do a research for a student on a major, you know, say I'm going to spend an hour doing this and just keep it an hour because we all could and research is something most of us enjoy. So we could spend three or four hours, but are you going to charge that client for that hours? So time box your time so that you can keep control of that and make sure you're thinking about your overhead when you're paying your dentist or your attorney, and you're paying $300, $400, $500 an hour for an attorney, that money is not going straight in the attorney's pocket. It's going to his receptionist. It's going to his professional organization. It's going to his certification. It's going to the lights. And you have similar overhead. Your professional development, um, all those college visits, all those things are parts of those costs that you need to include. So include those costs for resources that you use, you, your overhead. So rethink what you're charging and why you're charging it and don't undervalue who you are, what you have to offer. I get these questions all the time. What should I charge? How many students should you see? What's a full-time load? Well, those are relative questions. What should my services be? And how many hours should I offer? So I'm here to tell you those are the wrong questions to ask. What you should be asking and the right questions is, well, how much money do you want to make? Set a revenue goal. If you don't have a revenue goal, then you're not doing a business. You're doing a hobby. So set an income. What income do you want to make? And then from there, you figure out, okay, here's what I want to make. Here's how much time they have to do it in. Maybe you're small, you know, you have small children and you only have 20 hours a week or 12 hours a week to spend. Maybe you're just going to work on the weekends. You know, put that in and that will help you calculate and identify what your client charges are going to be and the load you're going to have. Maybe you want to work with lots more students at a lower price point, or you want to provide service to a much smaller number of students at a much higher price point. It's up to you. But the right questions to ask start is how much money you want to make and how much time do you have to do it? All right. So check out my upcoming Name Your Prices three-hour workshop. And these are paid workshops. These three-hour workshops are paid workshops that you can sign up for. I have a coupon code. It's Friday Forum that you can use to get a discount, a $30 discount off of the workshop. But but those are, I have the next one coming up soon. So check out the website and see when the next one is. All right, so how do we offer services? There's a lot of different information on that. And I have a shared folder that goes along with this workshop. It, the, the link to it is on my website. And it has some of the latest pricing surveys. One was done by the ICA, just our state of our industry. And the other one was done by College Planner Pro talking about pricing and how people do pricing. I think you'll find those very interesting. But just in a nutshell, basically you can either do comprehensive, you know, do plans or charge on an hourly basis. You can charge, you know, there's pros or cons for whether you do comprehensive or hourly. And so look at it and, and most of all, whatever fits for you. Because when you have that mindset and you set up your approach, then you're going to be able to confidently and completely share that with your prospective students. I want to emphasize though, comprehensive does not equal unlimited hours. 
um, in Stephen Antonov's most recent book, A Student of Colleges, if you haven't looked that up, I would recommend it. It's an excellent job. Um, he says, he calls the Antonov pricing Bible. And he says, this is what he says, thou shalt not offer unlimited hours. Comprehensive just means looking at the full um, services um, menu that you offer. You know what what is the structure and the services you offer. It doesn't mean it's unlimited hours. So um, make sure that's not one of those mistakes that you're making is offering unlimited hours. Um, you're leaving money on the table if you are. But what you can do is offer value and options, especially as a service based industry. These things are th opportunities that you can offer to your families to make things more applicable to them, give them more options and opportunities. So first of all, offering value. I think that's a given. Second of all, you can do is bundle services. You know, maybe you'll offer um, college planning and some you know, financial aid appeals, or do some task prep, or, you know, interview prep, whatever it is, you can bundle services. I also recommend offering three to four levels of service. And I'll show you the details on that. But if you only have a really high price and really low price, people are going to gravitate toward the low price. And when they really should be doing your more comprehensive, higher price. So I'll show you how to avoid that problem. Um, offer upsell opportunities. If you offer my basic, you know, take my basic service. Well, here you can pay another $500 and I'll work, help your child with their honor college application. So things like that. And you can offer niche services. Many people might offer specialization in sports or athletes, um, performing arts, neurodivergent students, or any combination thereof. So, so those are opportunities to offer value and options. Use that to structure your pricing rather than just going with low pricing. Number three, sales is a four-letter word. Do not look at sales as a negative thing. This is how we all grow our business. Promoting something you believe in or have a passion for can become second nature. I've created a little graphic with all five of these. I'll put this in the folder that I'm going to share with you. Um, but, you know, think about sales as just don't, don't even think of the word in your head. Just think I am sharing with people who I am and what I do. And the more you do that, the more you're going to be able to build and promote your business. Really what you're doing is building your brand and it's built on authenticity. You want to be consistent in your brand, the colors, the shapes, the approach, and you can use lots of tools like Canva and other things to help you build your brand. So it doesn't have to cost a lot, but you can actually build it. You're going to build this based on, and this is where going back to point one, People are not going to pay you just because of the expertise that you have. That's a part of it. But research shows that people subconsciously make decisions based on other things as well. And one of those things is archetypes. And we have, there's 12 different archetypes. These were written about and identified by Carl Jung. And it is really does drive a lot of decisions. So they're going to be looking at your personality, how you do things, um, you know, your skills, a combination. Only you can be you. So you're building this authenticity, you know, make sure you try to be consistent and you know, you get some help to do this. And this is going to help you with your marketing. So building your brand is really important. And this is another thing that we look at and think about. I'm going to be offering an archetypes um, workshop and we're going to be offering some marketing workshops. So, so be looking for those. If that's an area you're interested in, we're going to be covering that. I want you to realize you have gold in your pocket. You know, I see this, one of the biggest marketing tools you have, and it doesn't matter if it's two people or 200,000 people, it's your client emails. 
don't hesitate to reach back to them. It's not a one and done. Once you work with clients, their students graduate, but they have younger siblings, they have cousins, they have friends, they have volleyball. I mean, there you never know when somebody is going to connect and need your services. So sending out client emails here, you know, some people will do a newsletter. That's a great way to market. You might just have a little blurb on updates or whatever it is, but use your client emails. It always amazes me. Um, I'll send a holiday message to everybody on my email. And of course, I've got people from 20 years back and I'll always hear back. People enjoy hearing from you. They'll send me messages. Oh, so-and-so is doing this and that. Oh, I had this question. Or they have a friend. Now they're going to graduate school. So don't neglect those client emails. They are gold in your pocket. They are that low hanging fruit. And think about the power of Starbucks. And by that, I mean, Use this to create incentives. You know, if you say, oh, I'm offering, say I'm op you're opening a class or you want to start a group coaching project, you can send emails to your client email and said, here's what I'm doing. You know, if you sign up by X, Y, Z, you'll get a discount. Or if you send me a referral, I'll send you a Starbucks. So any kind of incentive is very powerful as you use your emails. And again, you can start with two people when I started my coaching, I had probably five people on my email list. And now it has grown in three years to um, you know, 10 plus times that. So it's just one-on-one, -on -one, just keep that. But think about the power of Starbucks, you know, having incentives. And don't be afraid to ask your clients. Make sure you ask them for a follow-up testimonial. What did you, what helped? What didn't? Can you ask? Do you have any friends to refer? And I'll give them my friend discount. And people love referring friends when they know they're going to get a discount. And then when they come to you, they already know what you do. You, you know, half your battle is fought. So gold in your pocket, use your clients to help you build your practice and just start at one place and keep going. Um, it's not going to be everything, but it will help you in whether you're new or you've got 20 years experience. When you're pricing and setting up your prices is what I referred to earlier, is don't have a high and low price. You should have at least three prices. You know, have a high-end service you never expect anybody to take advantage of because then it makes all your other things look really, really reasonable. And then you have a middle offering one, a middle offering two. These are the two ones you want to drive people to. So you either have three or you have four. And then have a very, very low-end offering that you only offer to people who are just like, I need you. I'm going to do it all myself, except I need essays. So, you know, you can offer that and that's where some of the hourly, you can have a minimum three hour block or six hour block or 10 hour block, whatever you work with. Um, in my practice, I've found this as effective when people come to me, one, because I'm in California, most of my students apply to a California State University and a University of California. And some of the CSUs are as, as competitive as a University of California, Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo is one of those. So people will come to me and say, I know I want to apply in the agricultural program at Cal Poly. Can you help me with that application? I, if that's all they really need me to do, then I will do the low end offering because that's what's appropriate for them. So it's part of your consultant's journey. Think about what your services are and how you can direct them to the middle. And this is one of the things that we talk about in the Name Your Price workshop. All right, how do prospects find you? Make sure you have a mobile responsive website, use social media to help in building your brand, use your connections. That's why your client list is so important. Use a CRM, Customer Relation Manager, to gather emails. Put them on your website. And this is where you can offer incentives, free diagnostic, free consultation, a free workshop, you know, free whatever. And then you, you can also create a what are known as lead magnets, that free diagnostic, maybe a checklist on, you know, have you done everything to finish your application? That's a lead magnet. You put it on your website and say, here, here's this wonderful document. Oh, you want this? Give me your email and I'll send it right to you. Very easy very common and it makes a big difference. 
So all of this is part of your prospect's journey. And we'll be doing intensive workshops on marketing, um, social media. I'm going to be doing one on LinkedIn profiles. It's a huge benefit in terms of social media. I think it's a very neglected area in our industry. So I'll be doing some workshops on that. But find, help prospects to find you. And that's how you're going to build and market your business. Number four. And those of you who are in the same era of life that I'm in, remember the Beatles song, I want to hold your hand. And this is what we do as consultants so much. Oftentimes, it's really hard to find the balance between providing professional expertise and becoming a babysitter. So you want to provide that expertise, empower your students but not be a babysitter. And that's the key to being a successful entrepreneur is finding that balance. And I know it's not easy. And I know we're all still working on it. I don't have it perfected yet either. But by focusing on this part of your client's journey, you're going to empower students. You're not going to be there when they go to college. Parents aren't going to be there when they go to college, even though they may threaten to move in on the dorm room next door. Um, by showing parents that your students can do it, it engenders trust in the parents. It also, as you're doing this and setting those boundaries, this is that work-life balance. So you're not doing that essay on Thanksgiving Eve or Christmas Eve or Passover, you know, set those expectations with an ethics or team document. And that will help you to set clear boundaries as well. So that part of it, I want to hold your hand. Don't babysit them, empower them. And that's what you should be doing. As you're doing this, emphasize the process you know, that you're going through with them and that you're guiding them. That's part of their journey. Student self-reflection, the college search and lists, the financial aid and college applications, and then finally decisions and transitions. So if you emphasize, here's what I'm gathering and guiding you through, then that's what they're going to focus on. And then this connects back to your pricing. You're the only one that's taking them through this journey. It's more about this process than how much you know. You're there as a project manager, as a coach. You know, sometimes we have to um, motivate our students, you know, kick them in the butt sometimes and move them along and give them that hard talk, just like a coach would. So that's what your role is. And that's why don't worry about how much expertise you have. You are able to do all of this and provide this process and guide the students. And that's empowering them. So number five, here's the last one. I can do it all myself. And we're especially tempted to do this when we start out. We have no money. You know, I can't afford anything. So I'm just going to do it all. And I have time on my hands. But you, you should cultivate a mindset from the very beginning of maximizing your resources. So you have superpowers. So you want to use those superpowers effectively. So some things you can outsource like bookkeeping, um, different, um, you know, essay work, things like that. Use technology. That's what's going to help you build your processes and it's going to help you create your business to be more consistent and the outcomes are more replicated from student to student or family to family. So there's a, a whole other workshop that I do on just adopting or changing technology. Check that out if you're interested in that because technology is your friend. You can streamline office processes, sometimes using technology like the CRM. It can do a lot of different things. Your college planning tool might be able to do other things. So look at how you can streamline that. And then the last thing is to enlist help. Sometimes you may need your family's help to help you get over the hump at a busy season or bring in a virtual assistant or you know other people. They don't have to come in to replace you, but you can find people to help you in a supportive role. Don't try to do this all by yourself. You are much better off using your time doing what you do best just working with students. And if they're going to pay you 250, 280, 
300, whatever the number is per hour, why are you sitting and doing some bookkeeping where you can pay somebody else $20 an hour to do that? So use your time wisely and focus on doing what you do best, where your superpower is, which is working with students. So this all goes, all these five things go into building an IEC practice. Some of you are just starting or in that first stages of it, which I call launching. Some of you are building your practice. You've been doing this for a long time and, and now you're ready to go to the next stage. So as a coach, as the college counselor coach, I can help you by focusing on whichever journey you're looking at, whether it's prospects, clients, consultants, or your organization. Your best business investment is the one you make in yourself. That is going to give you returns over and above anything else you do. So I'm going to be offering, as I've mentioned, different opportunities. Um, name your price, which is working on setting your rates. Reflect and reset is an opportunity as well. And I have those on this page here. Uh, lead magnets and email list. We're going to talk about that. Polish and position. How do you do marketing? This is with my friend Gina Lester. LinkedIn. If you're wanting to update your LinkedIn profile, we're going to, I'm going to offer a kickstart. And then the last one, what's your brand? Fast track using archetypes and how you could use those. So those are three hour workshops. There is a cost to them. They're $195 with coupon as part of my audience. They're $165. So, you know, check them out on my website, send me an email, send me a note. I'd be glad to share and explain. Um, explain any of these to you, but it's important to invest in yourself. So, and they also include coaching, individual coaching sessions. All of these I'll include either a 30 or 60 minute follow-up coaching. And some of them include a follow-up meeting with other people in your group. And that's just as valuable. I keep these really small so that we can have them as a meeting, not a big webinar like this. And it gives you an opportunity to really meet other people, connect with them, and then share information with each other and build that relationship there too. I have people from last year who really, really um, created and connected with others, and it just became such a valuable connection and relationship for people. So that's the other thing that I use the workshops to foster. Coaching groups. These are one-on-one -on -one coaching, I'm, I'm sorry, these are group coachings, uh, two versions, one's for launching if you have five years or less of experience or building a successful college practice that's five or more years. I'm going to be launching these in February, so watch for emails about them. They're about nine weeks long. We meet every two weeks for about 90 minutes. You also get assigned accountability partners or buddies. That gives you an opportunity to really get to know people. So again, these groups are limited in size. And then, of course, the last one is the one-on-one -on -one coaching. And so those are at your, you know, le your leisure, at your own meeting dates and times, and you can pick which one of the four areas you want to focus on. So I'm so glad to be here today. And I see there's, we've, I've answered all the questions since I've gone through. So I hope and look forward to hearing from you. And you can reach me at Cindy, C-Y, N-D-Y, at cindymcdonald.com. Thank you for being with me today.